Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Leonard Baines, the Dean of the University of Houston Law Center. I want to welcome you here to our Black History Month celebration. For those who are not affiliated with the University of Houston Law Center, I'd like you to know it's a top tier law school with nationally ranked programs in health law, intellectual property, and the part-time program. We've also been honored with a number of awards for our diversity and inclusion, including the HEAT Award by Insight into Diversity Magazine. Our pipeline program has been designed to increase diversity. It's also received awards from the ABA, uh, the ABA Alexander Award. February is Black History Month, and for the past seven years, we've been delighted to celebrate it. Black, Black History Month's first iteration was called Negro History Week. It was created in February 1926 by Carter G. Woodson, known as the father of Black history. This month-long celebration in the United States and Canada is a chance to celebrate Black achievement. This year, it also follows a tumultuous period where racial justice and reckoning has been a fever pitch, providing a fresh reminder to take stock where systemic racism persists. I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Sherry Burr, who's a real Renaissance woman. I met her uh, quite a while ago at the University of Hawaii Law School, where I was uh, working and teaching during the summer, and she was a visiting professor there. She's a Renaissance woman because she's excelled in many different disciplines and areas. Professor Sherry Burr joined the University of New Mexico Law Faculty in 1988 after having received her AB in politics from Mount Holyoke College, her MPA in international relations from the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, and her JD from Yale Law School. In 1994, she received tenure and promotion to full professor at the University of New Mexico Law School. And during the 2008-2009 academic year, she served as acting director of the Africana Studies Program in the College of Arts and Sciences. She was honored with the Regents Professor of Law in 2012, the Dickinson Chair in Law in 2013, and she's been a Monticello Fellow in 2015. She became Professor Emerita in 2017 at a very young age after retiring from full-time teaching to become a full-time author. Her current research focuses on the free Blacks of Virginia, the hundreds of thousands of African Americans who were free before the Civil War. Bar, Bar, uh, Burr's ancestors were among this group. As I mentioned, Burr is a Renaissance woman. She's taught intellectual property, uh, art law, entertainment law, wills and trusts, international law, and a variety of other courses. She's authored or co-authored 26 legal and business books, and many of which have received numerous awards. Not only that, she's traveled to Alaska, Alaska and, uh, and has published travel articles about her travels with her own photographs. And in fact, in December 2000 until 2003, she wrote a weekly column for the Albuquerque Tribune that included analysis of politics, race, sports, and entertainment. Burr's manuscript for Living with Her Nephew placed second in the 2006 Southwest Writers nonfiction book competition. She's also served as president of the New Mexico Black Lawyers Association and chair of the art and law and international law sections of the Association of American Law Schools. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Sherry Burr. Thank you, Dean Lynn Baines. It's so great to be on the same screen with you. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you as we did uh, during those Hawaii days so long ago. Um, times have changed, <laughs> and you are now in a in a great position. And I really appreciate that since you've been dean, that the University of His uh, Houston has had a uh, Black History Month and has celebrated it with various speakers. So I, it's my pleasure and honor to be part of that this year. It's always I wish I was there in person. My family has a connection to Texas. My great grandmother and her sister sibling. Uh, siblings were born there. Um, and so it's always nice to spend time in the Lone Star State. So I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, start my presentation. 
And the dean and I went back and forth, and he was very interested in the genealogy research that I did that led to the book Complicated Lies, Free Blacks in Virginia from 1619 to 1865. And so as part of that research, um, I looked at um, ancestors who had been enslaved, ancestors who were free, and then ultimately finding ancestors who were enslavers on my Burr family paternal line. So every story has a beginning and mine came in the most unusual place, but still out in the West in the state of Wyoming. I had uh, broken um, an ankle and I was holed up in my house for several months. And one of the things I ended up doing is going through a bag of letters where I found one from my great aunt Callie, where she mentioned she was on her way to Wyoming to take care of Aunt Lillian, who had been her aunt, in this small town of Warland, population 5,487 at the time. And I was doing research on an intellectual property book, and I was planning to go to museums in Montana and North Dakota. And I thought, well, why not fly into one and out the other and drive through Wyoming on the way and, and see if I can find out anything more about this this um, Aunt Lillian. And so I stopped in the clerk's office. I found um, the grantor's deed and the grantee's deed when she had received the property, when she sold the property, went down to the accessor's office and they found, um, they found uh, the correct address and they told me how to get there. Uh, and this is her house in Wyoming. And what happened was I knocked on that screen door and I introduced myself as the um, great, great niece of Lillian Faye Todd and a wonderful woman named Mrs. Lucy V. Hill said, come on in. And it turned out that she had bought not only Aunt Lillian's uh, property, she'd also bought all of her furniture. Aunt Lillian had had this mahogany furniture trekked out from Chicago, where she had lived during the Roaring Twenties before moving to Texas and then moving to Wyoming. Uh, and um, when she died, uh, Miss Lucy V. Hill and her husband had purchased her furniture along with the property. And they had had, um, uh, Miss Lucy V. Hill had had 18 pregnancies and 17 children. I met several of them. And my Aunt Lillian had said at one point, you keep having all these children, why don't you name one after me? So the next child was named Lillian. And this is um, Lily V. Hill at her confirmation sitting next to my, uh, my Aunt Lillian. Uh, we, I swapped stories. She told me stories. Uh, Lily came to visit. I met her, and um, and it. Uh, I ended up having um, a ceremony at Aunt Lillian's gravesite because there was not a gravestone there. And I met her best friend and several other people in the community who had known her, and that made me even more intrigued that someone who had been gone for 38 years at that point had had so many people who remembered her so fondly. Um, so I was on my way to do research at the, um, uh, well, to give a talk in Salt Lake City, someone said, why don't you stop at the Family History Library? And I thought 15 minutes and three hours later, I had closed it down and walked out with a stack of census records that had traced Aunt Lillian's father, who was my great, great grandfather, back to a schedule that said free inhabitants of Virginia in 1850. And her father was living on the farm with his grandfather, um, who it turned out had been freed um, before the Civil War in 1757. So uh, I'm sorry, 1787. So that led to more research. And eventually I started um, delving into what happened to the Africans who arrived in 1619. There had been Africans who had arrived in this area of the world before that. Um, many of you from the West may have heard of Estevanico or Estevanico, who led Spanish conquistadors in the 1500s up from Mexico to um, uh, through the area that we now call New Mexico and Arizona. But this, um, this arrival in Virginia was the most important in the sense it was the first time there was a permanent settlement of Africans in this country. And this is a depiction that somebody uh, put together um, 
uh, trying to depict what they thought happened when the first Africans arrived. And as you can see, there were men, women, and children who were among the, the captives. And these people had been double kidnapped. They had been kidnapped out of their home in Angola, which is in um, South Africa, um, next to Southern Africa, next to um, South Africa. And then they were on their way to Veracruz, Mexico, where they were gonna be um, enslaved in mines. And um, instead they got kidnapped um, and um, brought to the shores of Virginia. And there's a plaque uh, commemorating where when they arrived in Georgetown. So if you ever go to uh, Jamestown, so if you ever go to Jamestown, uh, you will see this plaque commemorating the arrival of the first Africans. And uh, John Wolfe had wrote about 20 or an odd Negroes who had arrived in Virginia. So one of the things that's interesting about this arrival, the Dutch ship that brought the 20 Africans to what would eventually become the U.S., is that some were treated as slaves and some as indentured servants who, after a term of years, they were accorded full citizenship rights, including the right to vote and own property. One of the challenges of doing this research was the shocking discovery that at no time did the Virginia legislatures ever like officially just come out and state that all Africans are slaves from henceforth. Rather, it was a convoluted um, evolution of the laws over time. And so um, one example of the beginning of disparate treatment was in 1640 when um, uh, John Punch, who was an African who was an indentured servant, ran away with two Europeans who were also indentured servants. And when they were captured, the whites received years added to their indentured servitude. The black John Punch was, sold, was sentenced to slavery. So he would have a term of life for years. One of the fascinating things about John Punch is that his 11th great grandson became the first black president of the United States by way of what we would consider Barack Obama's white um, mother. So um, genealogists have done the research and uh, John Punch's uh, family married European after European to get to the point where you have Toots, who was Obama's grandmother, uh, and then you have um, uh, his uh, mother, who looked completely white, but they actually descend uh, from John Punch, who was a, an African. Um, and uh, so that was one of the examples of free um, of a free black who was an indentured servant. So this cluster, or what we are now thinking about, is cased after reading, or cast after reading the book Cast by Isabel uh, Wilkinson, is that this free black cluster grew organically through uh, bursts and manumission. So that happened over a period of time in Virginia. And one thing I want to point out um, straight away is the difference between manumission versus emancipation. So manumit was a private release from slavery or servitude, which is something that happened to my fourth great grandfather, Gideon Hill. He was released from slavery as a two-year-old, he and his parents as a two-year-old in 1787. Emancipation is when the state frees a group from bondage. So think about the Emancipation Proclamation that Lincoln uh, passed or put, put out um, in which he proclaimed that all the slaves um, owned by people in rebellion against the United States are hereby free. And of course, it was a, an interesting document to put out that time because Lincoln had no control over the states that were in rebellion. But he did uh, put out the Emancipation Proclamation. And over there were over a period of years, there were instances where Virginia emancipated slaves for what they call meritorious uh, service. So for example, a slave um, turned in a group of counterfeiters and he received his freedom from the state. He was emancipated. The first official mention of the word Negro in a Virginia legislative act occurred uh, in 1630. So the free blacks have been here 
um, uh, Africans had been in the colony for 11 years and they ordered Hugh Davis, who was English, to be soundly whipped before an assembly of Negroes and others for abusing himself to dishonor of God and the shame of Christians by defiling his body and lying with the Negro, which fault he is to acknowledge next Sabbath day. And over the time, looking at the, the rules that Virginia passed, and, and there's a great book called The Black the black uh, rule, the black laws, black rules of Virginia, um, was that anti-miscegenation was a, a rule that they came back to over and over again. Um, and so I counted between 1630 with this, um, this legislative act and 1967 when the US Supreme Court uh, decided Loving versus Virginia, uh, the state of Virginia in one form or another had passed 337 years of legislation passing, uh, punishing miscegenation. Now the legal status of Africans I mentioned was convoluted and by 1660 Virginia passed laws to base legal status on matrilineal heritage. This was a big shift from the legal status that coming out of England where it was patrilineal. Um, the oldest son inherited the estate from his father and he passed on the estate to his son. Um, and uh, what they did was they changed it so that status would be based on matrilineal lines so that a free woman would give birth to free children and enslaved women would produce enslaved children. The legal status of the father was irrelevant. So an English master could impregnate his slaves and produce more slaves. But an English woman who had a child by an enslaved person would give birth to a free person. She might be punished for violating the anti-miscegenation laws, but her children would be free. Um, one other thing that I think surprises people, and it definitely surprised me when I was doing this research, was to find that uh, Blacks and Indians had the right to vote prior to 1723, in which um, uh, that year, Virginia passed this law saying that no free Negro or Indian whatsoever shall hereafter have any vote in any election. Um, there's no legislative record on what caused the Virginia legislature to strip this cornerstone of civil liberties from all Blacks and Indians, including uh, those who were landowners, but they did that. So we know Africans arrived in 1619. We know many of them um, um, over that period of a couple of decades were indentured servants. Um, I write about Anthony Johnson, who um, who owned ended up owning a plantation worth of acres. He owned 250 acres, and he uh, invited um, or paid for the passage of English servants to work his land. Um, so uh, by then, 1723, um, blacks and Indians lost the right to vote, and I think it's important to bring that up because uh, the right to vote. Is, is constantly under challenge. And it's important to know that once you lose it, it can be difficult to regain. Uh, the, um, one of the um, things that's, I have this picture of black soldiers in the Revolutionary War when um, General Washington rode north from Virginia through Pennsylvania to check in on the Continental Congress. And he was given his command um, he found that a lot of the northern troops ha were, had, command, had regiments of black soldiers. In some instances, they had integrated the black soldiers with the white soldiers. Uh, and um, he became impressed with the courage and the fighting spirit of the blacks, the free black soldiers. And I think that this contributed to his decision to ultimately free all of slaves uh, in his last will and testament. Now, the free black population in um, um, in the United States. It's interesting. Um, the first census is 1790, but in Virginia and Maryland, there were there were some um, census records. And uh, pre-1790, we know that Virginia had 1,800 
uh, free blacks. And by and that was probably taken around 1755, the census. By 1790, Virginia had 12,766 free blacks, which included my ancestors. Uh, and uh, Maryland had 8,000. I want to draw your attention to the North versus South rules uh, numbers, because you'll note that um, throughout the entire antebellum period, this only goes to 1810, uh, there were always more free Blacks in the South than the North. And um, I'm sometimes asked, why is that? And I think because once people received their freedom, they were in a community with relatives, you know, one person could have been freed and his, his um, other relatives might have been sla enslaved uh, and they just didn't wanna leave uh, the territory. Uh, and then others also, how would you know what you would be going to? It's like let, like today where you can just uh, Google an area and decide, oh, I think I'll move to Houston or I'll think I'll move to Amarillo. Um, they didn't have those options. So unless they had some kind of access uh, to knowing about other places, they tended to just stay put. Uh, after the Revolutionary War, a lot of planters started freeing their slaves. Um, some of them thought, why should we continue to hold men in bondage when we ourselves just fought to be liberated from King George III? Uh, so from 1786 until 1802, thousands of slaves were granted their freedom either by deed or will. Uh, and But this growing number caused consternation in the Virginia legislature. So in 1802, Virginia legislature, legislators passed a law requiring slaves granted freedom to leave Virginia within a year and a day of receiving their emancipation. And it also, or manumission, um, they also passed a companion law that if free Blacks left Virginia to obtain an education in the North, they could not return to the state. So that also encouraged people to keep their family close because if they sent their children away, their children could not come back. Now, I mentioned Gideon Hill. He was my ancestor who was freed during this period where there were many manumissions. And he was born in this area called Deep Creek, Virginia. And this is a sign that's still there. Um, and he, he's buried in the cemetery that was set up in 1840 outside of Petersburg, a community of free African-Americans. They purchased this one acre tract to serve as a burial ground for um, for people of uh, free blacks and uh, of color. So getting out of slavery, I mentioned that people um, were manumitted. Sometimes um, their servitude ended. This is John Kaser, who is involved in a, a famous law case uh, from that time, famous at that time, where he sued for, um, for his um, release from indentured servitude. Um, another way they got out was self-purchase. This is Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley, who was a dressmaker, and she purchased her way out of slavery. Um, Mrs. Keckley is known for having dressed uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, Mrs. Jefferson Davis, and Mrs. Uh, Robert E. Lee. This is one of Mrs. Keckley's dresses, which is in the Smithsonian for dresses worn by first ladies. So you can, you can still see one of her dresses uh, today. And what was fascinating was that um, Jefferson Davis, after he was, after the fall of the, the Confederate cause, um, he tried to escape wearing um, a woman's uniform and they displayed a woman's dress. They displayed the dress at a, um, a World's Fair and Mrs. Keckley was at the World's Fair and she recognized the dress that she had made. So um, a dress that she made for his wife, um, Jefferson Davis had borrowed and had been captured wearing it. Uh, People were born free, as I mentioned, um, that if you uh, free, free women gave birth to free children. This is um, Solomon Northrop, who's uh, famous. 
uh, for having been kidnapped into slavery. A wonderful film that won an Academy Award many, many years ago. Um, he was born free because his father had been released from slavery and his mother had been re uh, released from slavery. Uh, and he was well known for his fiddle. And I thought, um, I like to show an original picture of him. Uh, and I thought they did a pretty good casting job in the film, if you saw the film. Another way people get out of slavery is what I call self-liberation. Um, Harriet J uh, Jacobs wrote the book Incidents in a Life of a Slave Girl and how she uh, stowed away in her grandmother's attic for quite a while before she was able to get safe passage out of her time. Uh, and then also, um, this is Harry, uh, uh, a youngish picture of Harriet Tudman, who's probably the most famous person known to have self-liberated or run away. And of course, Harriet Tubman went back over and over again. I mean, there was a wonderful film about her a couple years ago, uh, showing how many people uh, she brought out of slavery and the dangerousness of her mission. An example, I Mrs. Mrs. Uh, I mentioned Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley purchased her way out of slavery. Here's an example of some other people who purchased their way out of slavery the years they did it because they're in deed books and their purchase price. So it could vary. So what happened was the, um, the enslaved person had to negotiate with the slave holder for a price. And the enslaved person usually saved their money over um, uh, that they earned from working on their day off, which was mandated by law to be on Sunday. Uh, and then they negotiated a price and, uh, and then they could purchase their way out of slavery. And then that got registered in the deed books. Um, an example, uh, I don't want you to ever go away thinking that a lot of these free blacks were just super poor because some of them owned a great deal of land, including this Frankie Miles who owned 1,100 acres of Virginia property. Um, and these are really large numbers. My uh, fourth great grandfather, he owned 12 acres. Um, but these are, are large numbers of land that people were owning um, pre-Civil War South. Um, now, I've, I've been, I've often thought, you know, why did this go on for so long? And so here's a slide that shows the increase of the enslaved population. It was estimated 800,000 in 1790. And um, it looked like for a period of time, that 1786 to 1802 period, that slavery was going to go away because people were manumitting slaves. It was uh, a conversation how wrong this was to hold people in bondage. But one of two things happened. One, um, Thomas Jefferson arranged for the, purchase, the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the United States. That led to the removal of uh, Native Americans. And then that led to white settlers moving in, trying to uh, farm cotton. And that led to a growing need for more slaves. So what you find is a growing uh, percentage. And so by 1860, 19% um, of um, of the wealth in the in the United States was measured in enslaved people. Um, uh, another uh, aspect of this, I mentioned miscegenation. Um, here are two men, uh, Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson, who both wrote a great deal about how slavery was wrong. Uh, and they both had uh, families of color. Uh, everybody knows of Thomas Jefferson's relationship with Sally Hemings that uh, produced four children that survived to adulthood and he uh, liberated all of them. Um, uh, the first two, the oldest two, Beverly and Harriet, were allowed to run away. And I say run away in quotes because uh, Jefferson never went looking for them. And anybody else who ran away, he really went looking for them. He put ads out and, and so forth. And Harriet, he had his overseer purchase her ticket on a stagecoach to leave. So it's it's kind of strange to call it running away when the master purchases the the. Um, the stagecoach. And at the end of his life, he passed a codicil to his will where he arranged to liberate the last two of Sally Hemings' children uh, and they were freed. Um, Aaron Burr had a relationship with a woman of color that produced children, two children of color. Um, uh, 
And what we most know about Aaron Burr, these dueling pistols because of the, uh, the duel between um, with Alexander Hamilton and the wonderful song in uh, Hamilton the Musical, The Ten Dual Commandments, there are actually over two dozen uh, commandments. Um, uh, but there are a lot of things that are interesting. One, that he was orphaned so early in his life by age three. Uh, uh, at age 16, he graduated from the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton. He had applied as an 11-year-old to be admitted as a junior. They said, no, you've got to wait. He got admitted as a 13-year-old as a sophomore, and he graduated at age 16. Uh, he was also a colonel in the Revolutionary War. Um, uh, General Montgomery died in a very famous campaign in uh, Canada. He wintered at Valley Forge. Um, he became the third vice president of the United States after he and Jefferson tied for the presidency in 1800. It took several votes, uh, over a month worth of votes before Jefferson finally came out on top. And in those days, the, uh, the president uh, got the highest number of votes and the person who was vice president got the, um, the second highest of votes. Here's an Aaron Burr family tree. Uh, his wife he married, his first wife he married was Theodosia Bartow. Um, they had two children who were born. They actually had two stillborn children. Um, Theodosia Burr was the only one to live to adulthood and she died uh, as a 30 year old right after her son had died uh, in a mysterious uh, disappearance at sea. And then with Aaron's relationship with Mary Emmons who was a servant from South Asia, from India, um, uh, he had two children, John Pierre Burr and Louisa Charlotte Burr, both of whom lived to adulthood and now have hundreds, if not thousands, of descendants. So um, I actually wrote uh, an article, uh, Princeton and Slavery. Uh, so it's slavery.princeton.edu, where you can find an article where I have the founding father and his abolitionist son, where I talk about the relationship between these two men. Um, Aaron Burr wrote a lot about how slavery was wrong, but it was John Pierre Burr who actually implemented that. He was a well-known abolitionist on the Underground Railroad, hiding slaves in the attic. Um, in the cellar, in a dugout in his backyard. Um, and so there's lot, lots of more details about that in an article which the president of uh, the Aaron Burr Association said my long article because it's 4,000 words, uh, but I have written a great deal about that. Um, and then I will just close by saying um, people want to keep the door on slavery closed, but I think it's important to open the door both for people of African descent and for um, Europeans. Um, this is a letter I received from a woman uh, in August 2020, who ha after George Floyd had died, um, had been asked by her son if there were any slaveholders in her family. And she did the research and she came across that John Jonathan Crawley, who she knew about, was the son of Susanna Crawley and Benjamin Crawley in my book. And that's how she found out that she had descended from um, slaveholders. And she wrote me, uh, there's more to this letter, thanking me for the research. Um, and also from a, a, a standpoint of Africans, I encourage people to open the door on slavery because um, even though there is that stereotype of slaves were enfeebled, couldn't take care of themselves, what we find in looking at the research that was far from true um, and also that, that the people who were brought out of Africa were quite resilient. They, they survived the, the passage across the, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they survived being in a condition of bondage. And I think in many ways, it's, um, it's important to acknowledge uh, the contributions of our ancestors. So I will stop there. Here's just a note on how you can obtain a copy. You can purchase it and mail it to me uh, and I will sign it for you or you can email me and I will make other arrangements with you. But this is my book, Complicated Lies, Free Blacks in Virginia. And this is a picture of the shores of Virginia from where these Africans uh, first landed. So thank you very much. And I know the Dean has 10 minutes of commentary before we open up for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Burr.
That was very illuminating and uh, spectacular research, really terrific. As I said, she's a Renaissance woman and I'll see whether I can do justice to this in 10 minutes or less. I have a lot of slides, but those who know me know I have a lot of slides, but I'll do them quickly. Um, so let me share my screen. Let's see if I can find my slides. Hold on for a second. This always happens to me that they sort of disappear on me. Okay, let's see if I can share the screen and see if they come up this time. Okay, so, yep, great. So let's do from the beginning. From the beginning. So my point, my challenge is to do this in 10 minutes to comment on uh, Professor Burr's great work. So I wanna first talk about um, finding your roots and this really great quote that Nick Sheedy, lead ge genealogist said, every little decision our ancestors made charted a path for us as their descendants. History is not static set of facts. We're connected to history today. And I think that's really very, very important to recognize it's not just our biological or our genealogical ancestors, but it's our historical ancestors in terms of our founding fathers. What everything they've done made us who we are today. So one of the things as, as Professor Burr indicated, she talked about Pres, uh, Pre, President Jefferson and Professor uh, President um, Washington, but we know that 12 of our former presidents enslaved people, eight of those, 80 of the, those presidents enslaved, enslaved people while they were in office, and some had black descendants. So we have, as Professor Burr talked about, uh, Thomas Jefferson had a long time relationship with African-American woman, Sally Hemings. George Washington, interestingly, people thought he was sterile. Um, he married Martha, who had children. He adopted uh, the son, George, uh, named George Washington Custis, and he fathered children with a black woman on the plantation. But there's also rumors from uh, the family, and this is a very well-regarded family, uh, of this individual, West Ford, who was on the Washington plantation, and they believe that they are descendants of Washington and an African-American woman named Venus. And one of the things I think is important as we see that oral history is really important, that people who have these experiences in their family, they are remarkable experiences and people will share them from generation to generation. And the same thing with a lot of our other founding presidents. So oral history suggests that James Madison um, the Black family indicates that he had children with an African-American woman named Corrine. Uh, James Monroe, oral history suggests that he had children uh, with Afri an African-American woman. Andrew Jackson, oral history of Black families indicate that he also had descendants with an African-American woman named Hannah. William Henry Harrison, oral history suggests that he had children with a black woman, African-American woman named Dilcia. Uh, John Tyler, there were campaign rumors that he had fathered several black children. There was a vice president of the United States named um, Richard Johnson who lived openly with a black woman and had several children with her according to the Washington Post, recent Washington Post article. And so it's really the paradox that Professor Burr talks about that our founding principles say in the Declaration of Independence we're in that we are free, that we're equal. Slavery is rarely mentioned, rarely mentioned in the Constitution, only in terms of the um, uh, the, um, um, the stoppage of the export and importation of, of people of African descent. Usually it's very much nuanced as Professor Burr said in some of the laws that because people knew it was wrong. And you, you know, the way one place is mentioned is not mentioned, but it's where it's discussed is the fact of the three-fifths clause that of the Constitution where um, uh, people of African descent were, were counted as three-fifths of an individual for congressional representation, but they weren't given any political power. And part of this is because, as Professor Burr indicated, there were so many Black people in the South, uh, and, not, and some were free, some were enslaved, and there weren't very many whites in the South because as you, I've read, read articles, before air conditioning, it was hard to get many people to move to the South. This is, um, uh, Professor Burr looked at census data in the early part of the 1800s. If you look at this census data, 
1860, right before the Civil War, you see the large, these are the Confederate states, you see the large percentage of enslaved people in each of the states of the Confederacy, ranging in, you know, sometimes over 50% or very close to 50%. So very, very large percentage. And a lot of that is concentrated in the South, not the North. But the other part of this whole situation, which Professor Burr alludes to, is this deeper paradox that, as she mentions, the anti-miscegenation laws, but also the exploitation of Black women. Because what you see with a lot of this is that why are these many of these planters, founding fathers, even though it's no, supposedly wrong, even though they've been whipped, et cetera, even though, as Professor Burr said, there are 300 different statutes in Virginia dealing with race, interracial relationships. Why was it happening? So part of the reason why it was happening is that there weren't very many women generally, and there were a, you know, there were a lot of white men. So roughly 700,000 more white men than women. And I would imagine, I don't have the data on that, there's 1860 census. I would imagine the South is probably even more extreme, this, this um, uh, dichotomy, and over 100,000 more black women than men in a population of 31 million in 1860. So part of it is that you know, you're on a plantation, you're in a small family of, of white household, you're surrounded by black people and brown people. Uh, there may be a few white um, overseers. And for some of the young men, it's ex experimentation. There's a variety, you know, or just comfort or other things that's going on. And that's why you have this abundance of miscegenation taking place in the South as, as, amplify, as exemplified by some of our founding readers. This McGill University study says that essentially all African Americans have some European ancestry, that African Americans living in the Southern states have more African American ancestry than those in the North. But conversely, African Americans outside the South have a larger fraction of European DNA. They say that most of this has happened before the Civil War, that most European DNA among Afri people of African descent happened before the Civil War because of all the race-based mixing. And the genetic, genetic patterns observed by the researchers suggest that at least for, at least for a century before the Civil War, there was ongoing admixture between blacks and whites. And only after slavery did it drop off steeply. The McGill study also suggests the reason why there may be more people of European ancestry, black people of European ancestry um, uh, in different parts of the region is because the great migration of African-Americans out of the South was genetically biased. And maybe African-Americans with higher fraction of European ancestry who often may have had lighter skin, had a better social opportunities in the world, thus in a better position to migrate to Northern and Western states. So it's really this understanding, it's important for us to understand this paradox that African-Americans were chattel, they were considered, you know, not necessarily human, but then they were, the women unfortunately were, you know, taken advantage of, which led to this pigmentocracy that's sort of based on skin I was going to talk a little bit about the Baines family history, but we don't have enough time. Uh, my family is from the Caribbean. It's the race mixing happened actually even more in the Caribbean because it was just so few white individuals uh, in many parts of the Caribbean. And so uh, if there's any questions on that, I will illuminate uh, more during Q&A. But Professor Burr has to leave in 15 minutes. So I want to be mindful of that and have the audience be able to ask any questions. So if you have any questions, please put it in, in the Q&A and I will uh, gladly serve as moderator to Professor Burr uh, so that she can answer, she or I can answer any questions that you may have. So I see- Yeah, there were several questions. Um, okay. One person asked me to share the book information again. So I want to bring up that slide. Okay. Just share that very quickly. Um, other there were, so can you tell me the other questions about slavery that were in the Q&A? So um, 
a few mentions about slaves being freed in wills upon their death. Yeah, I can talk about that because okay. um, in the various deed books you can go through, I mentioned Washington and Jefferson freeing slaves in their wills, uh, but there were several others. And one of the fascinating parts of it uh, was you go through all these deed books in the Library of Virginia and you find how people freed slaves or didn't free slaves. And also one of the shocking parts was sometimes they would leave a slave to one child and then her, the slaves increased to another child. So talking about her children or in, in one instance, um, the, uh, the, uh, the testator left a slave to one child and divided the increase of that slave by two other children. So it, it's fascinating because you realize when they're talking about increase, they're talking about the slave's children. Um, and yet they use this in a way that they would refer to cattle, that cattle, you know, you would divide the cattle increase. Um, so yes, there were lots of mentioning of slaves, uh, slaves being freed in deeds. Uh, which would be during someone's lifetime or in a will at their death. And what happened in Washington's case was um, after he left a will stating that his slaves could be freed upon the death of his wife, Martha, she thought that he had just incentivized um, uh, 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 his slaves to do her in so they would get their freedom earlier. So she freed them by deed uh, within a year of his death. Um, so yes, slaves were definitely freed in uh, will or deeds. I think someone asked me about Mary Emmons being, was I sure that she had been brought by, uh, by Theodosius' husband? Um, that's the best evidence that we have because he was uh, working as a, he was a colonel, he was Swiss, he was of Swiss descent. He's a colonel um, in the British Ar Revolutionary Army. And he was in uh, this part of Haiti um, around the time that we believe Mary Emmons was brought to, um, to, uh, to um, New Jersey where he had a, a place called the Hermitage. And, um, and then he went away and the two of them never saw each other again. And when a colonel, um, <laughs> a lieutenant colonel named Aaron Burr came riding up, Theodosia took up with him. And so they had a relationship for a number of years before her husband died and then uh, they got married. Let's see, other questions? Fourth grade grandfather, explain please. Uh, so your fourth great grandfather, uh, so in my case, my fourth great grandfather was born around 1785. Um, that was Gideon Hill. So, um, so you go back, you know, you've got your father, your grandfather, your great grandfather, and then you get to the fourth great grandfather. So that's like seven generations ago. Any other questions? Let's see. Um, Somebody says it's been fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, that's nice. They want to bring me to Houston. I'd be happy to come when it's not cold and COVID's gone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So for family lines that are not as affluent, landowners or that spanned across nations and countries, how would you suggest pursuing answers when when it would seem there would be intentional barriers. Do you think it's important for poor people to search their lineage? And I would say, absolutely, absolutely. Now, finding the enslaved is a little bit more difficult than finding the slave. So basically what you need is an ancestor that you know of who was in the country before 1950. So you start with the 1940 census, it could be a grandparent or great grandparent, and you can go back from there to figure out their, their lineage. The challenge for the enslaved is often there are records, census records, where or tax records because people were taxed on all their property, including their slaves, um, and they would just list them by first name. So you need to know like first names of enslaved ancestors. And I think definitely it's critical. It's, it's important to understanding who we are as people. Like I, 
I had a dean at um, UNM Law School who always commented, Sherry, you're so entrepreneurial. You're so entrepreneurial. Well, when I did the research, I found out every generation, you know, going back to this fourth great grandfather had owned a business, had owned land. So it's not like, you know, we get just put up here and we're just magically who we are. A lot of the things that our ancestors did continue on in who we are. Let me also answer that because I know the student also has Caribbean ancestors. So I went to Barbados and I also did some research and Barbados was a big slave colony. It was one of the most productive colonies. And there are a lot of records there that you can obtain. But as, as Professor Burr said, you really, if you don't know your, ins, your enslaved, enslaved ancestor, it's hard to know and who those people are. And many of the names were very similar. I don't know if you have the same, that experience, Professor Burr. A lot of them were biblical names, like Mary, Joseph, John, I mean, very, very, like, like taken right out of the Bible. Some of them were what we called probably derogatory names. They were naming people after their color or their background. And so it's really, you know, it is very disconcerting when you see that. But I do agree with Professor Burr. It was really an interesting exercise. Uh, oral history is very, very important. Uh, and oral history is a way to sort of start that, you know, that research. Yes, um, yes, definitely. Um, a Nancy Braddock asked, did antebellum lawyers have language clauses used in wills to free the enslaved or bequeath, divide the um, enslaved among their children? And yes, they did. Um, you can just, you can look up any of these documents. Some of them are now digitized, so you can find these documents uh, freeing slaves. Uh, a lot of times people just did it themselves and then had it uh, uh, recorded. So um, there weren't as many lawyers as there are now per population compared to then. Uh, can you be a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution? One of my cousins uh, several decades ago and, uh, try, applied to be a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And they said, well, we can see how you trace your lineage back to John Pierre Burr, but we don't see how you get from John Pierre to, um, to Aaron. And that's part of the challenge for, um, for uh, people of African descent who are descendants of some of these people who fought in the revolution. Um, Family history is that Aaron married Mary Emmons in Haiti. They journeyed to Haiti after the death of his wife. Uh, but a, um, a descendant like three generations ago tore up the marriage certificate, Aunt Dahl tore up the marriage certificate because she got upset that nobody was paying any attention to the lineage. Um, so, uh, so I've often thought that if I could get to Haiti and do some research that I might be able to find a duplicate of that marriage certificate. Uh, thank you. Fascinating. Uh, have there been longitudinal, Shauna Levis asked, have there been any longitudinal studies regarding the social mobility of Friedbachs and those who weren't? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I know that after the war, a lot of free blacks like my ancestor left. So um, George uh, uh, Hill had uh, been born in Virginia in 1847. Um, as far as I can tell, he first left and went to Ohio where he worked for a congressman. He then left and went to Texas where he had some children. And then he went to Oklahoma. So there was a great deal of mobility after the Civil War of people um, uh, of people leaving. So uh, studies, go ahead. You know, there are also studies of people of African descent, whether they're from the Caribbean or from the United States, that those who move, willing to move, are likely to be more successful, which makes sense. It's sort of like yeah. the internal immigrant, I mean, they're migrating. You know, people who do that are usually likely to be more ambitious, more risk-taking, et cetera. So, um, I don't know of any studies specifically about the earlier pre-Blacks, but certainly Blacks generally, there are studies that suggest that. Yes, definitely. And there are two questions answering, asking about the use of Ancestry.com. And yes, I have used Ancestry.com. In fact, I have a family um, study going now. It's been going on for a couple of years um, where I'm looking at genetic connections between people who have um, 
a Y DNA link to the Burr family tree back to uh, the first Burr to come here in Jehu Burr in 1630. Um, and so, yes, I'm definitely using genetic services. Uh, one person, oh, this is a person asking about island roots. Okay, was there anything I missed? I think there was one earlier, let's see. Um, is there a connection between the Caribbean and Virginia? So this is anonymous. Professor Bird, did you come across anything between relationship between the Caribbean and Virginia? There are, I don't know about Virginia, but there's a strong correlation between the Carolinas and Barbados. And then there's a strong correlation between Haiti, as you can imagine, and Louisiana. Uh, because you know, a lot of these families moved back and forth over property all over the place. They sold slaves, enslaved people back and forth. So I'm not sure about Virginia, but I know the Carolinas and Barbados is a very strong connection. Yes. And also um, one connection between Virginia and the Caribbeans um, was that when um, slaves ran away and slave owners viewed them as problematic, they often sold them to the Caribbean so they mm -hmm. could not uh, come back. Um, Washington did this. Jefferson had someone sold to the Caribbeans. So that was a common use. And it was well known that slavery was worse in the Caribbeans in the Sugar Islands, that you would be worked to death. So it was a way, uh, a threat. If you think you have it bad here working on my tobacco plantation, just wait till I sell you to the Caribbean and you work on the sugar plantations. Uh, so yes, there was a connection in that slaves were sold to the Caribbean. Are there any others? Let's see. Have there been any studies of the evolution of wealth accumulation among freed slaves and that how, how that wealth was invested? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, that that's an excellent question. Um, what I think, just based on my own personal history, um, I think even though, let's say, so my family still owns property in Texas. My aunt Lillian and my great, her mother, my great, great grandmother had two properties in Dallas uh, next to each other. And my father had been paying taxes on it. And then he had stopped. And after he died, um, his wife, my stepmother asked me, could I take over? So I started paying some of the fees on this. And then later I decided to go to Dallas and investigate. And I found out that the property was in a condemned flood zone in Dallas. Uh, so I, I, I thought, okay, well, this is not a great, great thing to, to do. Um, but I think it's possible that people who descend from those who had accumulated property before the Civil War were more likely to accumulate property after the Civil War. They had a little bit of a head start, I think, in terms of creating businesses and so forth. But we also know that a lot of the people who were freed immediately from slavery, that was their first goal, is to get their own piece of land. And Booker T. Washington talks about this in his book, up from slavery. That was their first goal of many Blacks is to get their own patch of land. And that was supposed to be part of Reconstruction to give newly freed slaves 40 acres and a mule so they could work their own patch of land. So the initial goal in terms of dealing with this um, freedom of, from slavery was to turn people more entrepreneurial towards um, working their land, working for themselves. Lots of compliments. Thank you. No, no. Glad oh, so great. many people have enjoyed the presentation. I very star. much appreciate so that. You. I think that's I think that's all the questions I can see. I'm going back to see if I've missed any. I've done rapid response, as they you say, because I didn't want to miss anything. I think we've I think we've answered all of them. Okay, that's sounds good. So I really want to thank Professor Burr for being with us and educating us about the uh, enslavers and the enslaved people and her particular family. It's, you know, more and more people are doing these ancestry tests and trying to find their family history. And it's great to know that you've been able to do that. And you're a role model for so many of us who may want to do the same thing. So many, many,
Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very grateful. And I always appreciate the opportunity to share this research and to encourage people to, um, to think about uh, doing this research because it's just, it's fascinating to see what you learn. Definitely. All right, well, thank you all. This is a great evening. I know, um, Associate Dean Tennessee, do you need to show the QR code again? So anyone who needs to get CLE will be able to get it? I will, with the closing song, of course. Okay, well, great. Well, <laughs> good night, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Bye-bye, yeah. everyone.